Hello, my name is Amy White. I am a historian and doctoral student at Liberty University. Today, I will be taking you through the origins of the Great War, more commonly known as World War I. This was a period of immense change for all countries worldwide. Tensions were growing. Most of Europe had become bogged down by their European imperial commitments to their allies and more prominently sustaining their colonies abroad. Thus, they became complacent with their relative peace on the continent of Europe and did not really grasp the threat that Germany under Wilhelm II was becoming, as we discussed prior. This tension was mounting and really it would only take a single spark to set the continent of Europe and really the world ablaze. The spark. On June 28, 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary, was riding in an open carriage through Sarajevo in the region of Serbia within the Balkans. A city Austria-Hungary had recently occupied within the past six years and left a very malcontent group of citizens in, in Serbia. Um, when his carriage was stopped by a member of a pro-Serbian conspiracy, that man fired two shots into the carriage, killing both the Archduke and his wife. Now, how could just two shots ignite a global conflict? Well, this is following on the heels of imperial expansion and the conquest that had left the people in the Balkans and really around the world fed up with imperial Europe. As we will discuss, the association between those regimes would cause a domino effect that led the continent and the world into the First World War. <clears throat> so the origins of this crisis really begin in Europe and in their colonies abroad. And because of those colonies, these different nations had created alliances. At the dawn of the 20th century, the world seemed fully ensconced in these alliances and without compromise were willing to back each other. The only war of note during this period was the Russo-Japanese War that ended very quickly um, with the Japanese victory um, and otherwise remained very stable. These are the countries that were included in these different alliances and what we call the great powers including Italy, Austria, Hungary, uh, Germany, the Ottoman Empire, uh, France, Russia, and Great Britain. And then there's Serbia, Ber Bulgaria that Austria, Hungary had that backed them up. So we had these countries that ha had all banded together and that, that those made this alliance work and became evenly matched over the years. <laughs> Excuse me. The first um, alliance out of the two was the Triple Alliance. This was made up of Germany, Italy, and the Ottoman Empire, Austria, Hungary, also supported by their conquested territory of Serbia, Bulgaria. Then we have the Triple Entente, the second alliance that comprised of Imperial Russia, France, and Great Britain, and all of them were united together. And the United States at this time, well, eventually they will come into the Triple Entente Alliance. Um, the U.S. was firmly uh, trying to stay in isolationism, and the people simply did not want to go to war. <clears throat> So now the crisis really comes down to these alliances, who backed whom and went to war. Within these alliances were fully committed prospects uh, of uh, different alliances backed by their colonies. From 1900 to 1910, Europe enjoyed relative peace with steady economic growth, including many technological advancements, including airplanes, automobiles, radios, and the cinema. The great powers had consolidated their colonial conquests of previous decades, and alliances were evenly matched. 
However, two significant changes undermine the stability of the world. Tensions in Europe were mounting as Germany continued to swell its forces and its, its technology for making war. Meanwhile, the Ottoman Empire was slowly falling apart. Uh, it was growing weaker and weaker, leaving a dangerous power vacuum in the regions it had once held control of. And as they were kind of falling in back home, the different groups were rising up and creating a great struggle. So all of this unease and kind of chaos was causing that issue. Ultimately, the alliances formed during the previous century had drawn the lines of what would become the Great War. From the 15th to the 19th century, the Ottoman Empire was one of the most powerful states in the world. By the 19th century, the Ottoman Empire had fallen behind, both economically, technologically, and militarily. Europeans had often referred to the Ottoman Empire as the sick man of Europe. The Ottomans were weakening as it lost various providences, including Macedonia in 1902 and three, Bosnia in 1908, Crete in 1909, Albania in 1910. Um, 1912 saw Italy conquering Libya, which was really the last stronghold Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire had in Africa. Um, and then the rise of Serbia um, and, and then Bulgaria in 1912 and 1913 really created this, this chaos that they could no longer sustain their empire as a whole um, and really shrunk them back to modern day Turkey. As a result, the Turks began to assert themselves against the rebel minorities and the meddling forces. The blame was placed upon Sultan Abdul Hamid II for the decline, the guy that had revoked the Young Turks Constitution, as we discussed before. And when he became scared of the uprisings, he, he shut it all down. The Young Turks then plotted to force the Sultan to reinstate their demands. In 1909, Parliament was dominated then by the Young Turks, and they overthrew Abdul Hamid II. The new regime brought back Tanzimat reforms, cracked down on minorities, and began modernizing its military. Thus, a dangerous mix of modern armies and nationalism was established in the Ottoman Empire. So just to circle back and recap, the assassination of Franz Ferdinand triggered a chain of events over which military and political leaders lost control, owing to the circumstances of the world at that time. This escalation quickly spiraled out of control into open hostilities. A dominating piece of the puzzle was nationalism, which essentially united the peoples of these allied countries, which it throws a whole nother wrench into things as this is Imperial Europe. And Imperial Europe is primarily at that time monarchies. And when the people are rising up, it changes the dynamics of things. <laughs> All of these variables escalated Europe in the direction of the First World War. Like anything else, peace requires a certain kind of balance in favor of peace. Beginning with the alliances, the rise of the nationalistic worldview, the escalation of military technology amongst all, and driven by the development that the Germans were really creating, which we'll discuss later. And finally, the tensions in this power vacuum in, in the Eurasia area in Africa really created this inflexible system that that was toppling and it was it was just not going to work out. <laughs> so mobilization. How do all of these events finally turn into warfare? Well, in 1914, Western and Central Europe had highly developed railroad networks, but few motor vehicles. And Europe 
European armies really had grown into millions of soldiers and reservists. To mobilize these forces, to transport them to battle, elaborate train schedules had been created and were required to make this all come to, to reality. Uh, once underway, a country's mobilization could not be canceled. It just, if it was postponed or something was changed or orders were withdrawn, chaos would ensue. So countries um, had their plans drawn up. France and Germany, uh, they could really mobilize their forces within just a few days. Russia had a less modernized railroad infrastructure and thus would need several weeks to to mobilize its forces. And Great Britain really had no mobilization plans owing to the security they felt they had on their island nation in that hope that that barrier would really give them time to mobilize their forces at home before they needed, needed to act. So at this point, decorations of war are coming in after uh, Franz Ferdinand passes away um sorry on so on june 28 1914 archduke ferdinand is assassinated france ferdinand um leading to a rise in tensions that explodes in serbia against the austrian hungarians and they declare war on july 28th a month later um this then triggers the alliances to then fall into place with their alliance and general mo general mobilization plans are then put into action for Russia, France, and Germany. So on July 29th, 1914, Russia mobilizes its forces, France on August 1st, and Germany right after them. Now war was simply inevitable, again, because mobilization could not be taken back and due to these rigid railroad schedules. <clears throat> right. Uh, so the war begins. Germany assumes that uh, they'll go to war. It'll be very quick. They'll sweep into Belgium and then down into France and and within a matter of uh, a month, really, take over France. They had assumed wrongly that Britain wouldn't join, and they figured that they could then swoop into France, secure France, and occupy it, and then uh, send its troops via the train networks over to the Russian border before the Russians had time to mobilize their troops. Um, this was not true. Britain realizes that. Germany is a threat, not just to them, but also their allies. And ultimately, if they didn't do anything, they would be next. So they joined the war. Um, and when Germany didn't back down after entering Belgium, they too came into the war. <clears throat> Throughout Europe, people greeted this outbreak of war with parades, flags, and expecting a very quick victory. Sociologist Max Weber wrote, this war with all its ghastliness is nevertheless grand and wonderful. It is worth experiencing. People still very much had this romantic idea that war is great and pretty and everything. And they didn't understand the brutality that this war with this new technology and everything would really create. No one foresaw this destruction or the millions of lives that would be lost or the just how Far it would destroy the economy and everything. So now Europe is at war. So here I would pause for questions. If anybody has any questions, I'd love to hear them in the comments below. Um, and uh, or feel free to reach out to me via email if, if you'd like. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you all have a great day. Thanks.